Good morning, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're doing very well today, and welcome to another Modern Donation League. This one is for Rakdos Midrange or Seared Rock, as our donor titled it in the list he submitted to me. So this is a straight-up black-red midrange deck. It is a traditional midrange deck structurally, in that we're not playing a companion, nor are we playing like Luris and Mishra's Bobble main deck. We are playing a traditional 1-2-3, eh, a couple fours along the curve. Good old-fashioned interaction, heavy, heavy depletion focus as always with a black-red midrange deck, and we're very aggressive, plus we have the I win button of Blood Moon, uh, which, frankly, is probably something that the Rakdos deck lacked. I wrote an extensive Patreon post detailing um, my thoughts on all of the black-based midrange decks, really, but specifically I spent a lot of time talking about my favorite deck, Green Black Rock, and naturally used this Rakdos deck as a bit of a comparison. And Rakdos lacks the mana sinks of Rock. That is the single biggest kind of conceptual difference in terms of how the games play out. So with Rakdos, you have more chances of inefficient turns or of not curving out how you'd like, simply because you can't rely on using your mana as efficiently as you can if you have a lot of mana sinks. It's a pretty simple concept, but it is worth exploring, and I did extensively in that article, and here we are kind of manifesting a few different ways to mitigate that. So this list comes to us from Benny Jackson. Big shout out to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Benny has simply been a confidant to your Patreon supporter for long enough to have earned this donation league. Pretty simple, and we really do appreciate everybody doing something like that to support the content. So Benny submitted a list very much like this one to me. We've made a couple tweaks that we'll talk about a little bit before we get into a league here. Um, and it was pretty similar to begin uh, to a list that I believe came in fifth in a challenge. I, don't quote me on that one, but it finished pretty well in a challenge. Since then, Willie Adel has finished second in a challenge with a list that is pretty different. But the point here is that the basic list that we're working with is proven and also the archetype as a whole seems pretty good right now, not going to lie. So Let's go through it. We've got 22 lands, and we've got no utility of any kind. The closest thing to utility that you can identify is a very high quantity of fetch lands, including three copies of Prismatic Vista, which of course help fuel a lot of our graveyard shenanigans and also help secure perfect colors for us in the face of of our own blood moons as well as opposing ways to disrupt our color production. We have a healthy density of one drop, interactive spells, one blood chief's thirst, two fatal push, three each of inquisition and thought seize, two copies of unearth and the play set of lightning bolt. We have also a dread bore in the two drop slot supplementing all of that wonderful interaction. And then three trios of premier two drop threats. I am the world's number one Crokes of Respecter. We've got three of him, three copies of Dark Confidant, who does continue to impress me in the deck despite some of the downfalls he can face in the metagame, and three copies of Magmatic Channeler. This is kind of one of those Monosync style cards, even though that's not strictly true, in that she's flexible, she can smooth out your draws, she can dig you toward a crucial hate piece or a crucial piece of interaction or just whatever else you might be missing. And she also does a reasonable red Tarmogoyf impression in the mid game or late game most of the time. So definitely a very intriguing card. Willie Adel swear swears by her. The Rakdos mains in my Discord swear by her. I am interested to give her a shot. Uh, we did mention Blood Moon. We've got three copies. We've got a lot of ways to loot things away. So again, it is really nice to have a, a card that can cheese wins out against almost anybody. More importantly, perhaps, than that, it is, it is a realistic way to beat the four-color piles, which otherwise I don't think we have a realistic chance of beating um, all else being equal. Two copies of Liliana of the Veil, and she is very much still a staple, I think, of this archetype, but she's not seen in as large quantities as you might otherwise expect if you're new to the archetype, and that is because when you're playing red, you have a critical mass of three drops that are awesome, especially when you're trying to fit in Blood Moon, but we've got the four 
uh, full four copies of Spyro and of Lightning Skelemental, so two very different cards, but two cards with immensely high ceilings. Spyro, as always, is the glue of the deck, helping us find the right half, helping us X for one the opponent in so many different ways. Just really, really powerful card. And three, excuse me, four copies again of Lightning Skelemental, which is really emblematic of what this deck does differently than other mid-range decks, which is try to close a little bit faster, at least a lot of the time. So, um, and also right on the depletion attrition plan, however you want to look at it. So I love the list. It's really, really nice. And the only change that I made or that Benny and I made after conferring was adding that third Blood Moon. I think it's really important here. I suggested that. And Benny had had a third unearth which i think is totally fine it's a high ceiling strong card you can always cycle it away if it's dead nothing wrong at all with that but if you look at jump ahead to our sideboard we've got two four drops kalita's trader of get and hazard at the fervent i like both of those two but i said look i think we might want the third moon and there's also a little bit of a non-bow if we're looking at three unearths and then two premier threats out of the sideboard, neither of which can be unearthed because they're CMC4. So Benny said, all right, let's cut an unearth. We'll play that third moon and we'll keep the bombs in the side, which I do love. And uh, speaking of the sideboard, yeah, let's start there. We've got Hazaret the Fervent, very well positioned, I would say, in the current meta. Definitely a nice fit for the deck. And Kalidas Trader of Get. Um, I think better positioned here than he would be in Rock by far for a variety of reasons. Number one, Rock needs to play Luris, in my opinion, so Kalidas may be going over the top of Luris if you are playing as a companion anyway, or um, even just raising the curve too much for a main deck Luris version. Also, we have so many kill spells in the black red midrange archetype that Kalidas can really thrive. Finally, we don't have the natural ways to stabilize behind like a scavenging ooze with life gain, or even behind a beefy brick wall Tarmogoyf, right? So Kalidas in that role, definitely really nice. And we're also not playing Cling to Dust in this particular version of Rakdos, so definitely warrants some life gain in the sideboard, if you ask me. So Kalidas helps with that. Uh, three copies of Brutality, speaking of the life gain. Um, all these choices were Benny's. I'm definitely down with all of them. I think Brutality is maybe not strong enough in just a pure card quality sense anymore to merit play as a full uh, with three. I think maybe more like two is what I would begin testing with if I were building from scratch, but definitely can't really complain about that one. Just something to mention. Two copies of the Plague Man. Never hate to see that. Two copies of Angrath's Rampage, giving us some ways to destroy artifacts and planeswalkers and creatures, and it's all edict effects, which can definitely play a role against certain effects. We have a Reign of Gore, good when the opponent is trying to gain life, especially against Heliod combo. A single copy of Ashiok Dream Render. Uh, a lot of weight will be on Ashiok's shoulders here if we run into Titan, but remember, we do have main deck Blood Moon, so that's definitely cool, but supplementary graveyard hate and search hate. And the change I made to the sideboard. So, we see four Leyline of the Void here, which is definitely a little unusual. This was my idea. Um, I'm going to pull up Soul Guide Lantern for us here to look at. So Benny initially submitted a list with four Soul Guide Lantern, and don't get me wrong, I understand why. Soul Guide Lantern, it's got a good ETB, and then you can use it flexibly, so it's a fine card. But it is overall, let's be clear, weaker than Nile Spellbomb, because... As much as we would like to be in a meta where the single ETB really cripples the opponent's graveyard and then you have the time to do whichever one is better, frankly, the Nile Spellbomb being able to sweep up the whole graveyard and draw a card is still better overall. But the reason people are playing Soul Guide Lantern right now is because Oops All Spells is an all-in graveyard deck that also plays Leyline of Sanctity. Nile Spellbomb targets the opponent, Soul Guide Lantern does not, so you can still sweep up the graveyard uh, against that deck, even if they have Leyline, and then do a bad Spellbomb impression against the other deck. So I get why people are playing it, but it really is a bad Spellbomb impression. If you have to bring this card in in, in tight matches against, like, Luris decks, or against... Uh, even just traditional Jund or maybe the Mirror match, you're going to feel so much worse about this card than you would about Nile Spellbomb. And Oops All Spells is a real deck, but last I checked, it's only like 10th or 11th in the meta to the extent that we have accurate stats. And so you're like playing a much worse card, in my opinion, for one deck that's not 1st or 2nd, but 10th or 11th, and it only matters if they have Leyline, which is 40% of the time if they don't mulligan, right? So whatever. 
you know, I understand why people are playing it. I don't like to play it. So I said, maybe we could play Spell Bombs. Or if you want something that also beats Oops All Spells despite Leyline of Sanctity, how about Leyline of the Void? And I think our deck here gives us a really unique opportunity to leverage Leyline in a mid-range deck simply because, number one, of that concern we mentioned about Oops earlier. And number two, look at all of our looting effects. We have Magmatic Channeler. We have Seasoned Pyromancer. We can tick up with Liliana. We have a lot of ways to make top decking a ley line of the void not as bad as it would otherwise be and our deck can unmulligan itself if we do find ourselves mulling a little deeper than would be preferred with a ley line thanks to the power of cards like seasoned pyromancer or we can just not make our card disadvantage matter that much if blood moon is a way to cheese them out while ley line locks them out right some matchups that'll be true so anyway the big spice here is ley line of the void if it doesn't work you can blame me if it does work, you can uh, thank me and thank Benny jointly. So speaking of thanking Benny, thanks once again, my friend. Appreciate your support. And thank you to all Patreon supporters. It really does mean a lot to me. We have a couple new ones to thank. Let me pull up their names here. We have a new Inquisitor named Stephanie Pace. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And a new unearthed tier member named Elusive Fate. Big shout out to our two newest patrons and to all OG Patreon supporters and everybody in between. With that said, let's play some Seared Rock, some Black Moon, some Rakdos Midrange in Modern. All right, we are on the play. Mm, it's a five lander and it's just two kind of one for ones in hand. I mean, Channeler can filter us out of drawing more lands, maybe, but I think we're supposed to mulligan this. It feels bad. Uh, we got another 5-lander, but this one's very disruptive. I'll keep. I will bottom. Maybe basic mountain so we don't run out of fetchables. And we're going to go Inquisition into nothing into Skelemental, but the opponent's mulling as well. We both keep six. Got it. Well, I played some practice games last night, and all of my opening hands were fire. I hope I didn't use all my good luck. Uh, the deck felt awesome, by the way, in those games. And we are against a Jeskai deck. Right, that's the Jeskai land. Yep, so I assume Jeskai Wildfire. We see Force of Negation, Cryptic Command, Valakut Awakening. Trying to decide how much I care about Force of Negation. Hmm. Tempted to take Valakut Awakening, but... Realistically, I probably should take Force. I realize that gives them the fourth land for Cryptic, but I don't know if they'll play it that way. It'll, they'll probably... Ooh, they play Spire Bluff Canal. Well, okay, because they drew Serum Visions. I was going to say, we really expect them to just play Triome and say go. In either case, I don't expect the spell side of Valakut Awakening to be relevant here. But you never know how these games go. Oh, man. Okay, we draw another land. So we open on a 5-lander. We mull to a 5-lander. And then our first draw step yields, you guessed it, a basic land. But... Um, maybe the opponent will be shields down at least this turn for a Skelemental hit, which is going to be sweet, and then we can always top deck well from here. Okay, we've drawn Dreadbore. It is at least action, but gotta imagine that's a pretty poor one against this deck, right? We do have a bit of a wrong half of the deck to be expected here. If the opponent's drawn Bolt, then we are... Very unlikely to get there. All right, Skelly connects. You love to see it. That's a big win. Um, we'll see what they pitch here. Maybe Valakut Stoneforge will be something that goes and it'll make me feel a little better about my Force of Negation take. One reason I took Force is just simply because, like, at any point in the next couple turns, drawing a Liliana will be pretty good. Um, have us both having mulliganed, us having drawn poorly. And indeed, they do pitch Valakut and Teferi, Big Tef as well. Lotus Field. Oh boy, I did not read this one correctly. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. 
I have... And then cleansing wildfire. Well, there's the wildfire. We did kind of expect that. But lotus field? I am unfamiliar, my friends, with this. I guess drawing blood moon would probably beat them pretty badly right now. And we do. Let's go. All right. So... No reason not to get a third swamp here, right? Well, there is a reason I shouldn't tank over this minor decision. I'm not going to. Um, we'll leave it in the deck for wildfire. Two swamps is more than sufficient for us to operate. All right, the opponent's been mooned. They can fix their own... Mono with Cleansing Wildfire, so we're very happy they fired it off last time. Hand is Cryptic, plus two unknowns. Let's draw another Skelemental. Or uh, I'll take any threat. They're just going to concede. Okay. So I don't know where Lotus Field comes into play. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie, my friends. I mean, Hexproof. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. We're just going to treat it like a... I mean, all the spells are just guy control, so that's what we need to beat anyway. Angrass Rampage could be better than other removal spells. Ashiok could play a role here. I don't know about Hazaret. That's another kind of maybe board card. I don't think I'm supposed to play Ley Lines here, having seen what we've seen so far. Collective Brutality seems good. But these days, three copies always feels a little heavy some, um, against most control decks. So we don't have that much to do, frankly, uh, that's like a slam dunk. But we have a lot to consider. We're certainly going to at least be able to get the bad cards out of the deck and take it from there. There is a world in which Plague Engineer is surprisingly good if they're on like Snapcaster and Vendillion Click. Naming Wizard, I think it is, to take care of both of those X1s is pretty good. But... Let's just probably be more conservative this first time uh, post-side. So I think we are going to just cut the pushes. Bring in the Brutalities. I think that's the cleanest change we can make. Angrath's Rampage versus Dreadbore. I think Dreadbore is better overall. How does Blood Chief's Thirst stack up to this? So realistically, we have to cast this for four for it to be relevant, unless you're just tagging a, a stray Snappy, uh, which may not even be in the deck for all we know. So I think a Rampage is better overall than a Thirst. I'll make that change. And I probably don't want to do too much else. Lightning Bolt and maybe Unearth could be make weights in either direction. But I think I'm interested in Ashiok. Let's play Ashiok. We're going to cut one on Earth because I think there's a more than zero chance that they are number one exiling our threats and number two maybe even playing hard grave hate. We'll certainly see. But this is more like the Rakdos hand we love to see. Opponent likes their hand, too, so we're in for probably a more powerful display from both decks than we saw last time, but we did see the power of just cheesing with Blood Moon. It's definitely part of what we came here to do, we have to admit it. It's part of the plan now. It's all part of the plan. Uh, speaking of part of the plan, we draw another Thoughtseize, so we're just going to absolutely rip their hand to pieces here if we can draw the third land before turn three. Opponent's got a two-lander. Whoa. Snapcaster Mage, Double Ether Gust, Shark Typhoon, Flagstone's Cryptic Command. I guess I'm just supposed to take one of these Ether Gusts for now. I don't strictly care about them, but I also don't care about the Snappy anytime soon. We draw Black Cleave Cliffs. Nice. It's on. It's on, my friends. We're on the Skelemental turn three plan after triple discard, so as good as Channeler could be, I'm, I'm going to Thought Seize here. If they let it resolve, I think I'm, yeah, 
Okay, I'm gonna take Shark Typhoon here. Yeah, I'm gonna take Shark Typhoon. Then we're kind of priced into the Ether Gust. Again, I don't think we care about Skelemental. Or excuse me, about Snapcaster Mage given our Skelemental. So we're leaving them with their two most powerful cards. Maybe Shark Typhoon is more powerful, actually, but you understand the point here. But when you are on Skelemental, and the opponent kind of senses this, they flash in Snappy for pressure and value. That makes sense. At the same time, I'm kind of okay with them doing that. Because, obviously, we can beat a 2-1 with our Rakdos deck. Ooh, opponent goes Lotus Field mode. Okay, this is a nice synergy with Flagstones. I just don't know if there are any other build arounds. I, I guess not. But we still get to get Land Cryptic out of their hand with a Skelemental. Oh, they're going to stay back. Okay, well, we still get to do that, right? Because a Trample and Haste are a couple of strong keywords. Alright, opponent knows that. Let's the hit through. So we've got them hellbent by... We've got a Jeskai control deck that kept seven hellbent by turn three. That's pretty good. They're also now at the spot where they'll probably just scoop to another Blood Moon, especially once we show them some threats. If we, if we can draw one, that is. We don't. We draw Black Cleave Cliffs, so... Just play a Magmatic Channeler, deploy the Cliffs. Feels a little bad to have drawn an ETB tapped land here, where we could otherwise double spell. But once we fire off the Dreadbore, this will be a 4-4, which is pretty nice. Okay, OP drew a bolt. Fair enough. Fair enough, OP. So if we don't draw, if we draw a brick, I think we're supposed to Dreadbore to uh, grow the Channeler before we deploy it. Ooh, OP Drew, Madcap Experiment. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I guess we're going to dread bore that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. I'm mindful of everybody's time, including our opponents, so I will not go through their whole deck before I do anything. This is an indestructible, right? It feels like it should be. Look at it, right? It looks like an indestructible creature. But it's not. It's going to get Dreadboard, which feels great. We get to grow the Channeler outside of Bolt and possibly Helix Range, as expected. And I think we have enough incentives to deploy that Blood Crypt rather than slow roll it to conceal information. So just in our free time between the opponent's actions here, we can look at their list. Blood Sun. Very interesting. Okay, opponent basically cantripping with Valakut Awakening. We draw Kroxa. Alright, seems good. Let's begin there. See what's in their hand and then decide what to do with Channeler, but we'll also have to do the math with... We'll see if we do the damage here with Kroxa. No, we get Shark Typhoon out of their hand, which is pretty good. So if we attack, we put them to 10, escaping Kroxa... Yeah. Hmm. The main reason not to attack here... Oh, I'm sorry, never mind. I'm not used to playing with this card. All we can do is attack. Ooh, I didn't think that one through. Maybe I missed a trick. We could have discarded Kroxa and then escaped him this turn. And then if we drew a one-drop spell or a land, also played that. Obviously, this is still pretty good. We're kind of making the opponent deal with two things that are hard for them to deal with at the moment. Um, but maybe that would have been more optimal. Like I said, I 
not used to playing with this card. You have to have a card to discard before you can activate her. Ooh, the attack. I don't know if that signifies anything per se. We've drawn Lily, which seems good, but not as good as Kroxa. Yeah, we're just staying with this plan here. Um... Well, one, two, three, four. I actually should attack first. At the risk of them playing something unexpected like Condemn that punishes us here. We don't want to shrink the channeler, right? Before attacking, that is. Alright, so now we will escape Kroxa, leaving as many instants and sorceries in the bin as we can. At the expense of our potentially top decked one of Unearth, which I believe is still in the deck. These things shouldn't really matter. But it's worth considering them anyway. I wonder what's in their hand. They're just going to concede. We'll never know. All right, that was a true depletion uh Clinic, and not not because I'm saying I played so expertly. In fact, I just outlined a um, thing I didn't think through well enough a minute ago that maybe could have been played a couple different ways. But that was a clinic in what the Rakdos deck can do. Guys, this is awesome. I love to see uh, us taking down a control deck like this. One that's got some unfair elements, too. You know, they've got the Lotus Field and the Flagstones synergy with... Uh, Cleansing Wildfire, not that that's the most busted thing in the world, but you understand the point. And um, they've also got the Madcap experiment that they're siding into, which is really, really cool. Um, and we did have to say, we do have to say we got pretty lucky. We had a nut draw here in game two. In game one, we caught them without the ability to get out from under a Blood Moon, and we did top deck that too. So definitely some good fortune, but also a good showcase for Seared Rock on to round two. GG die roll. We're on the play. We win the die roll. We've got a really nice keep, you have to say. You have to say. It's a nice keep. If the opponent plays something, we can bolt T1. We'll want to run out the Vista if it's a matchup where the life total matters. Um, if we're against another control deck, we'll wish we played Bloodstained Mire, so it's a really edge case decision. But... I think we want double colors anyway, so I'll take my medicine and probably fetch shock if I need to bolt T1, unless we're against, like, burn, and then I'll just play off double red, and if we draw Liliana, we'll loot her away to Spyro. Ah, that's against Tron, so never mind all of that. Nothing matters. Nothing matters. No decisions matter against Tron. That's not true, but Lightning Bolt is not something we're going to fire off to face because there is a world in which we deplete them enough where, like, they play a Karn and take it down, we bolt Karn, we pull, bolt the other Karn. So, anyway. Opponent's hand is so well stocked that I am going to, I think, play Bob over Kroxa here, and we've drawn a fourth land, which we don't yet need. Um, we can also loot Kroxa away to Spyro next turn and then under escape him turn four this way, maybe. So yeah, we're going to play Bob. I'm going to start thinning the deck out a bit, too, while we're at it. And use these uh, beautiful promo, whatever they are, prismatic vistas. We're on Mirage Basics today, by the way. A John Avon Mountain and the Bob Eggleton Swamp, which is one of the most expensive basic swamps on MTGO, interestingly. Yeah, look at this vista. Pretty cool. I'm not, like, over the top a huge fan of this framing and all that, but it's pretty cool. All right. We flip Black Cleave Cliffs. Can we draw, like, Skelemental? Oh, no. Oh, no, the Flood. All right. Well. Are we supposed to loot Kroxa away or deplete with Kroxa? Let's just begin with an attack. I think now, like, probably if they just have Natty Tron, we don't get there no matter what we do. 
So I'm going to hope they don't have Natty Tron, which admittedly would be a bit of a strange keep if they just kept seven. Maybe not. You know, if they have Sphere and two, two of the Tron lands and they just get unlucky and don't draw the third. But, you know, if they didn't have it, they would have cracked Sphere. So, whatever. It might possibly have been better to play a fetch land there, just so we can put another card in the grave for Kroxa. But again, if they have Tron, which they do, and they have so many cards still in hand, it just really doesn't seem like we can win. Having flooded like this in the early stages. Okay, so they make the they assemble Tron, but then they filter. Is this going to be a Thrag Tusk or what are we dealing with here? Karn the Great Creator. Okay. Well, again, it's something we can bolt. So I'm pretty happy about that, about keeping the bolt. Not firing off T1, not looting it away aggressively. OP will go get a walking ballista. All right, that's not very scary, all things considered, but... Okay. I'm going to bolt here for efficiency. We could untap and see what we draw, but... But, you know, it just means they've got more payoffs in hand, right? So now at this point, we want to draw Thought Seize and or Skelemental. Escaping Kroxa is definitely a thing. Okay, we haven't done either. I guess we escape Kroxa, see if they can beat it. One, two, three, four, yep. Another Croaks in hand and a Spyro still in the back pocket to double spell next turn. Okay, you know, we... If their resources were not quite so flush, I would actually be feeling like this could... This could maybe grind through good old Tron. Okay, we get Urza's Tower out of their hand. Once again, the turn will begin with a cracked egg. Into another egg. No sign of another land. Interesting. Huh. I'm not sure I understand their... Okay, they do have another land. Got it. I was going to say, having... If they didn't, I would not have necessarily understood their pitching or their sequencing, but... All this makes sense because they have another tower and another Karn, so they've just got redundancy for days. Feels bad. They'll have five mana this turn to work with. Maybe they just get ensnaring bridge here. I don't know. They sure do. All right. Well. That's a feel bad one. And we have Dreadbore, which is good. But whether we're realistically beating this bridge, I don't know. Um, I'm going to tab over to my list here. I mean, Lily Alt is a way to beat it. Getting underneath it is a way to beat it, but it definitely works at odds with our hand depletion. Um, we don't have main deck artifact. Hate, we don't have main deck shatter effects. That really sucks. Uh, okay. Well, let's just play it out here. And see if maybe they're... I don't know how cards could get stranded in their hand when they have 10 mana, but maybe they just have only lands from here, and we get to get in under the bridge with Spyro and Elemental and Lightning Bolt. Draw a couple more bolts to win. That's probably our only realistic path to victory here. 
Sanctum of Ugin. All right, there's a land, but it looks like they have a spell too. All right. Ulamog, I'm going to concede to this because we can't beat the bridge and we also can't beat that. Good enough for me. All right, well, let's get some artifact answers in. Angraf's Rampage will fit the bill there. Otherwise, it's another matchup where we don't have much to do, sadly. Uh, Kalidus is interesting just because it's a threat that can enable a one-for-one -one on Worm Coil Engine. Ashiok Dream Render can hate out searches a little bit on the play, but we don't have much to do here. So, the good news is that I think our main deck matchup is okay. Uh, once again, we don't want Fatal Pushes. And you can see... On Earth, Blood Chief's Thirst, Making Way, cards like that. Um, I just don't know if Kalidus and Ashiok are even better. We're definitely playing Rampage over Push. And we're definitely going to try to just win with Blood Moon and a quick clock. But around the edges is where things get a little murkier. I think I'll play Ashiok on the play. Kalidus is kind of neither here nor there. I think you could. I think we're just not going to play him. Um, let's just keep the curve lower, and I guess we'll keep Unearths and just not play with this Blood Chief's Thirst, which is a card that could do some things. You know, I don't, I wouldn't mind leaving it in if we had to, but we'll be more threat-oriented on the play, and we've got a really strong-looking hand that we just have to mull because it's operating off a of Lone Mountain, but Triple Thought sees into... Uh, Kroxa is definitely good against Tron with some ways to refuel after, but send it back. All right, this is a two-lander with... This is a nutty two-lander we're definitely keeping. Um, Blood Moon, Skelemental, Pyro. I think we have to bottom one of those. And it feels bad to bottom any of them. Am I am I dumb for considering the bottom of Skelemental here? I mean, it lets us triple down on our depletion plan, but I don't want to leave us with no... I don't know. This is real tough. Now I'm going to triple down on depletion. We'll bottom Spyro. And we'll get Basic Swamp for our Blood Moon, but the other... We need to draw a Red Land and also... Fetcha and then Shock with Marsh Flats this way. And it does make it worse for us if we draw... Another Basic Swamp as our third land. Ooh, opponent has Veil of Summer. And then a two-lander with Stirrings and both Karns. Gotta take the Veil, because we've got another Thoughtseize coming next turn. Good to know about that. Not that we had any real doubts. OP going to tap out for stirrings. We'll find a sphere. All right, so they're showing a couple ways to make green in the face of Blood Moon. We've drawn Magmatic Channeler. You know what? I think we're supposed to play her rather than Thought Seize because we can... Ugh, are we? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna. We have to be proactive here. We have to take high upside lines against Tron. They're not gonna Tron us anytime soon because they went turn one for us, right? So... There's the tower we knew about and the sphere we knew about. It looks like they're just going to say go. Okay, Inquisition. That could whiff. I think I'm supposed to loot it away. Trying to find a third land, probably. Black Cleave Cliffs, we'll take it. I 
I think playing Skelemental here makes more sense than Blood Moon. They could be holding up Nature's Claim right now. And we'll also have them discard without knowing that they're going to get mooned this way. It also gave them let fewer chances to like draw removal for a Skelemental, so they picked their high curve stuff, Liberated, and Ulamog go down. Kind of just want to draw another land so I can Thoughtseize Blood Moon and attack for one, I guess, but be one step closer to a 4-4. Four, four. OP will Sphere into Green, into Stirrings, into Sanctum of Ugin, into Chromatic Star. Croxa. Hmm. Yeah, I think we're still holding off on Blood Moon. So why don't we Thought Seize first, again, at the risk of them having Veil of Summer. Okay, we get Karn, and the reason we sequence this way is exactly for this. If they had another land in hand, Croxa gets to take care of it, whereas if we let on Croxa and they pitched the spell, Thought Seize would whiff. We also get three damage this way, which makes up for our attacker being a 1-3. <laughs> um, and no, we, we still are going to keep Blood Moon, even though there is strangely a temptation, I think, to pitch it. It's still just one other headache for them, right? All right, so some great depletion from our side this time. OP with an expedition map. Making us pretty happy. We kept the moon, obviously. Presumably they just get a uh, missing Tron piece. It is power plant. Lily of the Veil vale seems okay. But it's blood moon time. And then we are going to... I guess not. I guess we're going to attack. Um, if we hit a land off these first two, we get rewarded for pitching her, but we'll do that next turn. See what we draw. Need to put another instant or sorcery in the yard. So Chandler is looking, it must be said, just way worse than Dark Confidant right now. They'd be dead if we had Bob, or we'd be so far ahead they'd be virtually dead. Another moon, huh? Both of these cards are pretty bad. Uh, I don't know which one to pitch. I'll pitch the backup moon in case we find basic swamp, I guess, which is something we do want to find. We'll take Bob. because that will enable Liliana and Kroxa out of the graveyard. All right, so we're giving them an uncomfortable amount of time here. They're, they're just kind of making land drops and drawing playable cards, which really sucks. But it's kind of our fault, kind of our deck's fault, that we have not closed out the game after disrupting so well thus far. Um, as always, I could have maybe done a thing or two differently, too. I'm never discounting that. Maybe the turn we played Blood Moon. Who knows? But, hey, they've got Tron online now. So we're certainly glad we have it. There's a Thought Seize. There's another Kroxa. We can only cast one of them. Thought Seas will grow the channeler. So I guess I'm going to do that and then swing. If we could cast Kroxa, we'd probably kill them this turn. Oh, Ugin. <laughs> All righty. Yep. So if the if we had a second black for Kroxa, we'd finish them with the trigger. As it is, though, they're mooned. 
We got some great stuff. I think they're dead. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I couldn't think of anything that would save them because we've got reach with Kroxa. We've got ways to win on the ground in the face of a single removal spell. They can't cast a sweeper like Ugin sweeper effect. So that was close, and we were on the play. Um, I think we probably got a little unlucky to have Channeler stuck that way for so long. But again, I, I could have used her differently, maybe. In any case, what we did was good enough, and we are... Maybe not as excited about Ashiok, who is already a little borderline on the draw. But what could really come back in place of her? Like, maybe just like a Kalidas or Hazaret. Neither of which are very exciting. Ashiok can self mill. We could also play Blood Chief's Thirst as a way to beat like an early walking ballista or a scale up and to the mid game and take care of something. Maybe we're supposed to do that. I'll play Blood Chief's Thirst here on the draw. All right, we need the opponent to stumble this time, I think. Our hand is. Mm. Our hand is solid. It doesn't have Blood Moon, but it, it's really functional. It has a lot of what we like to see. Angrath's Rampage can stop them doing really good things early, but it's way better on the play. I think I'm supposed to keep this one with them mulling. I think if they kept seven, maybe we would be interested in digging a little deeper for Blood Moon. They go to five. Okay. Okay, I like it. I do wish this Inquisition was a Thoughtseize, because, you know, with them mulling deep, there's a chance it just whiffs. There's no Veil of Summer that's going to hit us, though, so that's good. Oh, we do draw Thoughtseize. Interesting. So now we have a choice. I, I think it's so bad to whiff that I'm going to Thoughtseize rather than I-OK. -okay. I-OK -okay can always be a token off of Spyro in a couple turns if we want that. As it turns out, uh, we would have hit with Inquisition, so we're punished. But I'm just going to take Sylvan Scrying here. And we're probably going to Rampage away an Artifact next turn. Just for the sake of efficiency, but that's a poor enough play that I really want to draw like Bob or Kroxa or Channeler. we got to draw a two-drop threat. That would be perfect. And they do actually just hold up mana, so maybe we are priced into hanging on to our stuff here. We draw Lightning Skelemental. Okay, well, should we Inquisition? I think we should, at the risk of them having Veil and at the risk of it whiffing. We're not doing anything else. Let's go for this. It whiffs. They have double Karn the Great Creator. Well, those are some great things to get out of the hand with Skelemental, but... My higher floor, lower ceiling decision to Thoughtseize T1 actually has been inverted into a more high variance decision, but I think on average that's really unusual. Nevertheless, it's what happened. It's worth noting for future games or future decision points, maybe. All right, they found a tower, which is frightening. Skelemental to the rescue. We've drawn Unearth. Interesting. Interesting. Could definitely be good in this game, but... Alright, so no matter what happens here we connected that's awesome we get rid of all his dust so they have a Karn in hand they're obviously going to try to just draw land here that's what we need to fade no land one time we fade it so now we can unearth the skelly which is awesome and we probably should i don't know though um 
because it's really mana inefficient. And like getting Liliana down now that we've drawn her is, is really, really appealing. Hmm. You know what? I'm I'm not gonna care about the mana efficiency. Let's just get them hellbent, smack them for six while the coast is clear to do so. If they have drawn like a removal spell, we'll be punished. That was a really interesting decision point, and I hope you understand why. Lily's very tempting there. We could maybe have also spiroed and hoped to draw a fourth land, pitching like our two, like Rampage and Dreadbore, but I want to hang on to this, frankly, to both cards, but. Ooh, okay. Yikes, they just blind top deck the missing Tron piece. Oh my goodness. All right, now we need to draw Blood Moon or we need a quick clock. We draw Unearth again. <laughs> okay. Um, nice. Nice. So. I think Lily now has become, has gone from awesome to not so awesome in the face of that power plant. So why don't we play a Spyro here, set up for lethal next turn, pitching Lily and Dreadbore. We do have a fourth land, so we're supposed to just hit them for six now and put them to two. Yeah, probably before they draw Grave Hate. Wow, Unearth showing up huge here, my friends. You'll love to see that. I mean, Lightning Skelemental really is the one that's showing up huge. But the two together. Whew. All right. Beautiful. So opponents at two, we've got a really wide board. We've got removal in hand. We've got another Spyro in hand. Oh my goodness, how good does this feel? This is, I think, the first time I ever played a Red Rock deck or a Rakdos mid-range deck. I was like, well, guys, we got our wish. We've got a mid-range deck that can beat Big Mana in a heads-up fight, and we just showed that here yet again. Obviously, it was close. It was tense. Uh, the opponent did mulligan to five here. But they had some good stuff along the way to Amal to 5. We had a lot of really interesting decision points. At the end of the day, we went on the aggressive plan and the depletion plan to the extent of our abilities and to the extent that we ignored other more value-positive or more efficient, mono-efficient options. And I think it proved to get us over the line in some style. So... What a fun league so far. This has been really, really exciting, and we are doing pretty well with Benny Jackson, Seared Rock. GG die roll yet again, and yeah, I, th I think we keep. There's a question mark over this. I am programmed to think that these Blood Moons are nutty because we just got off the back of a Tron matchup. In practice, they could be relatively dead, um, but... Our deck main decks them for a reason. I think we're supposed to keep a double discard hand with other spells in a blind game one anyway. So let's do it and hope the Blood Moons win us the game. Um, we can obviously cycle this on Earth. It's not looking very good with no creatures in hand uh, in its primary role, but you never know what comes off the top. And yeah, it's going to be Inquisition U off of a basic Swamp T1, see what happens, but... Opponent needs to settle on whether or not they're going to keep first, right? Looks like they will be satisfied with a full grip. Okay, well, Inquisition takes the only spell in their hand, which is Eladomri's Call. 
Makes me wonder if this thought sees is something we're supposed to fire off anytime soon, but we are against a lands deck. Valak at the Molten Pinnacle, Flagstones of Trocare, Bajuka Bog, Ghost Quarter, Celestia Sanctuary. So this is kind of like Titan Field, or the more evolved version of Titan Field, and obviously the Blood Moon will be great. Um, we've drawn Magmatic Channeler. All right, I'm going to play her... Uh, Yep, I'm going to play her. Proactive. And it's tempting to cycle the Unearth toward a third land for Blood Moon, but frankly, she can do the same thing if we feel comfortable looting away either a backup Blood Moon or a one of these other spells in hand. Opponent's drawn Temple Garden, and they've drawn a spell. Explore. All right. Well, it's all pretty rough, but let's just draw a land and Blood Moon them. And our troubles will be... I don't know if we can say over, but <laughs> definitely a lot less bad. So, definitely looting here with Channeler. I think I'm going to pitch Thoughtseize, um, because I want to start growing the Channeler... I also want to be able to cycle on Earth if we don't hit a land in the top two. We do. All right. Let's take Mountain because it's less painful. And by less, I mean not at all. And there she is, the Blood Moon Rising. Opponents found a basic forest. And they have a basic plane, so that's actually really bad. That's actually really bad. Now they can do so much. So now we need to find a kill spell for Dryad. Oh my god. Their draws have been really good relative to what we saw in the opener. You have to say, but hey, do we ever not have it? The answer is no, we always have it. Dreadbore off the top. Feels good. Um, yeah... Rather than doing any anything with looting, I'm just going to Dreadbore and attack. I, I do like our hand well enough. They're, they're so slow to deploy that I still am holding out what might be a little bit of a vain hope for the Liliana to be good. Opponent with an Explorer just punishing me at every turn here. Able to dump out the hand more aggressively. We've drawn a fourth land, but it's not a black one. So... I think maybe it is time to let the lily go. Let's try to find a skelemental or something like that. Oh my goodness, some bricks. Alright, I guess we just take the land, play it. I'm going to cycle in on Earth looking for a two drop threat. And instead we draw Swamp, which punishes us for looting away the Lily. <laughs> All right, things are not going our way. But, you know, maybe the opponent just never beats this Blood Moon anyway. But you have to say, you have to say, I think some really reasonable decisions are getting very badly punished. Opponent with a Reclaimer, we now need to top deck a kill spell for this. And we do, so to be fair, there is that. All right, we are just top decking kill spells when we need them. Um... Let's loot away Bloodstained Mire, though. And we're rewarded because we'll just take this Lightning Bolt, point it at the Reclaimer, be able to hang on to the other one. I have no idea whether this backup Blood Moon does anything, so I'm just going to play it. Since I don't know, we'll err on the side of like the card that locks them out, rather than, you know them having no outs to it and us being able to get value off of it by looting it away or something. Okay, OP with another Dryad. Okay, maybe that was a reason to hang on to the other Blood Moon. And another Reclaimer? All right, let's just top deck another kill spell like we always do. <laughs> Prismatic Vista. Nope. All right. Channeler has not let us down with the loots yet. Loot away the land. We find Lily of the Veil. Let's 
go. That's so good. So obviously we have to bolt here first. All right, so remember how I said Chandler was looking real bad compared to Dark Confidant against Tron? Chandler is looking completely amazing right here, right now. And they'll just scoop to that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Wow. What a deck. What a deck this is. I, th I have to say, I think opponents' draws were really good under the circumstances, but... Uh, and our draws were really bad in a lot of places, but the selection made them good. If we were just trying to out-top deck the opponent, we snap-lose. Um, but... <laughs> But we got there. Feels real good. So I'll be honest, I'm not up on what these lists currently look like to sideboard with precision. So allow me to mute for a moment and I'm going to look up a list, see if that gives me a little guidance here. All right, so I think we're supposed to sideboard relatively conservatively. Um, you know, strangely enough, I could see like playing a brutality. It's a little embarrassing against their big threats, but it kills a lot of weenies. They're probably playing Path to Exile, Ella Domri's Call. They showed us Explore, and they did show us Call, too. And also maybe Celestial Purge out of the side. So I think I'm going to try a Brutality. Um, I think it's actually pretty decent here. And what to cut is a big question. Our whole deck seems pretty good. They're probably bringing in Relics. I'm going to trim and unearth. And I don't see obvious cuts, frankly. As good as bolts were there. No, maybe we don't cut any on the draw. I'm not sure, guys. So maybe we're going to walk back that and we just have to trim a little bit around the edges. Pyro slow. Yeah, whatever. Let's submit a deck before we run out of time. Um, yeah, I could see maybe trimming a, a slower thread or two. This would be good if it was more than a one-lander. We could hope to get lucky. Honestly, I don't think that's the worst, because if we draw land in the top two cards, the Bob will probably hit us a third, and then we have gone Inquisition into Bob into Blood Moon, which is nutty. And we have a basic built-in to function under our own moon. I don't think this would be the worst keep in the world, but probably supposed to send it back and look for a safer six. And this is it. Definite keep. Uh, just wish this was my seven because it's a nutty, nutty hand if we had seven. Uh, because we have to bottom something, it actually has a huge fail rate one way or the other. Um, yeah, this is tough. You know, I, I think maybe we're supposed to get really greedy in bottom of land. Because we have to be able to... Thoughtseize, we have to be able to hit the board... We have to be able to Blood Moon, and we have to be able to Skelemental. So, like, what do you want? You know, I think we have to either bottom a land or maybe just bottom Skelly and not get greedy. All right, let's not get let's not get greedy, but I wanted to. But I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, if that was our seven, I'd be feeling pretty sweet. We should have bottomed the land because we top deck Swamp. Feels bad, man. Skyclave at, oh, the two-lander, but they have a Reclaimer. Um, yeah, but, oh, interesting, interesting. They have another Reclaimer, too? Hmm, I think I'm taking Reclaimers. I think I'm taking this Reclaimer, killing the other one, then Blood Mooning them. And, oh boy, if we had Skelemental to follow all this up. You can imagine. We've drawn Magmatic Channeler. Which is just fine, you know, something to do after we Blood Moon. We draw another Blood Moon. All right. Having a backup's probably good. Obviously, OP's got a basic forest. So they're not 
cold, but... All right, looks like they got a claim effect or something. Oh, Ella Domery's call in response. All right, to go get Rexage. So, or Night of Autumn, sure. So we'll have the backup Blood Moon. Seems good. Ooh, opponent finds basic planes, though. And I guess... No, I guess I've, surely they had that in hand, right? I assume they play Rexage, too. Okay, ooh, we draw Lightning Skelemental. That was a pretty good time for one you have to have to imagine. Exactly how shields down are we? Well, you know, I think we might have to play a Blood Moon anyway, because otherwise Skyclave Apparition... Like, I kind of want to lock the Skyclave Apparition out, right? All right, if our Blood Moon doesn't stick a second time, I think we're probably not winning anyway. So let's get the moon down, and we'll assume that the Skelemental is going to be good kind of at any point in the next couple turns if the moon works. But you could definitely go a couple different ways there. A third Blood Moon. Hmm. I'm not playing it. I'm deciding between Channeler and Skelemental. I'm going to go with the Skelly here. Run into some clunk issues where we're not really double spelling. But we have drawn all three of our Blood Moons by turn five, so who am I to complain? <laughs> Opponent hanging on to that prime time. Interesting. Skyclave Apparition and Wooded Foothills Bite the Dust. Oh, opponent's got Celestial Purge. Oh, man. Okay, so we may have found uh, our Blood Moons, but they have found a lot of good stuff, too. All the answers, really. Um, but... In Bajuka Bog's a great utility land, but it does not ETB on tap. So one, two, three, four, five. There's just shy of the prime time, and we have drawn Croxa. Nice. I was just gonna say we gotta play the Blood Moon and hope they don't have a basic forest effect in response. Instead, why don't we just play Croxa and get that prime time out of their hand? I think that's better, don't you? More of a sure thing. Wow. What a game. What an interesting game. I'm still feeling pretty scared here. Also not showing them the moon. Maybe they just like make their colors better and fetch a shock land. Like, surely they can't have a third moon, they'll be saying to themselves in hand right now. They they leave it uncracked. I guess that makes sense. And there's another one. Okay. So if they have a basic forest to get, they're gonna be able to get it. We've drawn Lily of the Veil. Hmm. All right, I'm playing Blood Moon here. Opponent didn't fetch in response. Okay, so we're now locking out prime times for the foreseeable future, which is amazing. We've drawn Lightning Bolt. All right, let's bolt the knight and take Lily up, I guess. Feels great to have drawn a castable, relevant one mana spell there. And here come the 1-3 beats. Okay, we're back to the stage where Bob would be better. <laughs> but I'm not hating the channeler. I'm just pointing it out. And of course, they both coexist in our deck. Whoa, opponent has a snow-covered forest. So I guess they just neglected to fetch it, and then they're just going to concede. 
I don't know if that's a shame scoop or if they think they're just behind regardless. Uh, but in any case, you don't necessarily blame them for, again, We I kind of thought that they wouldn't be thinking about a third Blood Moon, right? But we had one, so very fortunate for us. Our top decks provided very well in this matchup in a lot of sticky situations. I don't know how good this matchup really is because they have so much value, so many hard-to-beat permanents that are when they're resolved or if they get to untap or whatever. Um, but we're drawing Dread Boars, Lightning Bolts, Handcraft's Rampages at the right times. Uh, Croaks off the top was amazing. Guys, here's our biggest problem. There are like 10 cards already that have earned their way onto the thumbnail. I don't know what four cards are going to go on the thumbnail. This is wild. Anyway, 3-0 with Seared Rock, with Black Moon, with Rakdos Midrange from Benny Jackson. This has been a really fun league. Uh, let's hope our results and our fun continue into the final 40% of the league. See you for round four. GG, losing the die roll. Uh-oh, not a good sign. But our opening hand is pretty sweet, especially if they're playing to the board. We're going to keep, and if they're not playing to the board, maybe Thought Season to Blood Moon with oh, Field of the Dead. Turn one, Field of the Dead. All right, well, we've got Blood Moon rolled up against the Field of the Dead deck. Let's see which one it is. We've drawn the third land right off the top. You'll love to see that. There's a tension between getting a second black and making double red for Spyro, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Get our beautiful Mirage Basic Swamp Thoughts easy. We see Narset, Monolique, and Jace. Wow, so this looks like a blue-black deck with just Field of the Dead as a win condition. Well, this really sucks. <laughs> um... This is a tough call, not going to lie. This is a really tough call. Maybe we take the Jace? Maybe we take the Jace. I have to assume that Blood Moon's not straight up winning us the game, because they can fetch Island, they have a Swamp. They're not an all-in land stack like the last match. I'm going to take Jace and give them attention between holding up Monolique and tapping out for Narset, also giving us a chance to draw more discard spells to kind of be able to force issues as we see fit. We've drawn Lightning Bolts. All right. Maybe they'll go get a shock land here. You never know. Maybe they're a soul tie for Uro. That could be a thing too. I don't know. They go yeah, they're soul tie for Uro. Okay. So if they tap out for an R set, we're just gonna play Blood Moon and maybe it'll be better than it first looked. They have a Spell Snare. Really good to know about that. And now we're going to Moon them, and this might actually be a realistic path to victory. They have a Swamp, but the spells we know about are totally locked in hand. Opponent's drawn a Thought Seize, which is really good. I was just going to say, and we've got Spyro ready to start X for one and clocking them, but surely they take it, and indeed they do. All right, so now we need to draw something sweet off the top. We draw Fatal Push, which is kind of the opposite. That was a brutally timed Thought Seize from our opponent there. Now both decks kind of failing, and they rip Island? Really? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. 
Okay. We've drawn Dark Confidant, which gets Spell Snared or Mono Leaked as the opponent sees fit. So we just have to pick our spot and wait. And I think in the long run, you know, maybe our Blood Moon still does a lot of work here. Oh, they're going to Ether Gust the Blood Moon. Oh my gosh. Um. All right, I think it's so clunky now that we have to bottom it. All right, opponent's draws really couldn't be any better under the circumstances. You hate to see it. And if they now rip like a Planeswalker or an Uro, we're just completely punished and they rip Uro. Okay. Well, would you look at this? It is another amazing, fun, awesome league until we run into an Uro pile, and then everything just sucks. <laughs> and then everything's just awful. All right. Oh, I mean, whatever. I literally can't beat Uro anymore after all that with their permission in hand, too. So... Rather than running Bob out into the Mono Leak and Spell Snare, I think we just say go and plan to flashback the tokens. But some people are going to yell at me in the comments section for this. I'm sorry I don't like to play against this should-be-banned card. It just I hope you can see the difference in what's going on with gameplay in any case. Did I miss something here? Okay, no, we're just lagging. Got it. All right, discard spell would be good here. Another Bob. Not the best. Not the best due to the cards that we know about, so I think we just need to kind of try to time walk them here. Do nothing, but it's not a, it's not a path to victory. Whenever they decide to just say, okay, here's the Uro, can they beat it? The answer is going to be pretty much no. Um, maybe I didn't look closely enough. I guess they couldn't have escaped a row until right now with that breeding pool. But in any case, they gave me the vibe that they're holding up permission. And they still do, even though they can now escape them. So that's fair enough. Spyro. All right. It's a good draw. <sighs> okay, so we could force the issue with two bobs. First, we'll get snared. Second, we'll get leaked, or worse. That'll give them kind of permission to untap and play the Uro. I would be cool just kind of like making them blink first here, except they have Field of the Dead, so they just make a land drop, and we already can't win. We'll not win even more. So due to Field of the Dead, I'm going to blink first. I'm going to play out a Dark Confidant here. It's probably, it might not be the best line. Maybe we're supposed to hope they never draw a seventh land. But, again, I, I think the pressure exerted by field is such that we have no choice here. Probably looks like a weird play to the opponent. Maybe it is. Oh, they got cryptic too. Yep. These decks are something else, I tell you what. They are something else. That punishes us for taking our line, but whatever. It's not like we beat this deck anyway. Without uh, cheesing them like we nearly did with Blood Moon. Yeah, they ripped the island off the top. That changed everything. If they don't rip that island and the Aether Gust and the Uro, <laughs> like, yeah, I... I just have no fun against these decks, so I'm gonna concede. They they have us soundly defeated too, but I don't I don't wish to play. So let's just try to get some quick wins or have another five and zero chance stopped by a pile. Let's see what happens. Uh I don't know how good Reign of Gore is against Uro. It's pretty cute. I might play it just because it'll be a funny way to win. And uh 
If that ends up being the case, that'd be pretty amusing. Obviously, they're not all in on Uro with Field of the Dead and all those Planeswalkers as win conditions. Um, you know, I think like maybe two Collective Brutality is about right. Again, they have too many permanents for me to be happy bringing in all three. Hazaret is intriguing here. And then Rampage is a way to beat Planeswalkers. Let's start with Ashiok and the Brutalities, see what we want to come out. I think it's time to, once again, cut pushes. We have not been facing the small creature decks at all this league. Bolt is really bad against the Uro field half of the deck, but it's pretty good at taking care of Jason Narset and racing them as well. So... It's kind of a pick-your-poison spot here. Strangely enough, I, I think Liliana's pretty bad, even though she's good against control. They're playing all the Planeswalkers that draw cards and all of the, um, you know, the Uro and Field. But then again, on the play, we're probably, we probably have to have some things go our way. So why don't we try to leave her in? It's a big question just as to what to cut, as always, which is a really good sign for this archetype, by the way, in this list. I think maybe we tr do trim a bolt. You know, Blood Chief's Thirst is pretty slow. I think I'm going to play Angrath's Rampage at least over it. I don't know if we have room for Reign of Gore, as cool as that would be. Maybe not. Hazaret? I mean, again, Uro just kind of invalidates this card. Otherwise, I think it'd be pretty good. I'm, I'm feeling uncertain, so if you disagree, you probably have a good case to disagree in various points here, but I think I'm going to lean on the side of conservative sideboarding. Is it just like maybe Magmatic Channeler can get cut for a Hazarite? I realize we up the curve that way, but... They're surely playing some number of one-for-one -one removal spells that Channeler will die to all of them, Hazarite will die to none of them, if they're traditional black ones. So, um, sure, we'll do it that way. And I do like our keep. It's four lands. It's a lot of lands when we need all the gas we can get. But it is Thought Season to Bob and to Lily, the classic... Black-based mid-range opening, an opponent has Blood Chief's Thirst and Fatal Push. Well, Bob will not stick. Uh, we don't care about the Aether Gusts, so maybe we just take Cryptic Command and hope they don't have permission for Lily. We'll take the Cryptic playing the long game and hope they don't draw a Mono Leak in the first two turns. We have drawn a land, as I kind of thought we might. Feels real bad. I'm going to start filling up the graveyard proactively in case we draw a Kroxa, so I run out of fetch land there instead of a tapped blood crypt, valuing the deck thinning. And the graveyard fueling more than my life total. And I don't think we need a second swamp yet, or maybe ever, because we only have two lilies. The first one's going to come down right now. So... Okay, we have drawn a second Lily, so now maybe I get a second Swamp, just in case the game goes long. We're looking for Blood Moons. Sure. Will she resolve her? No, she will. Nice. Okay. So for now, I'm going to pitch my fifth land, but I'm interested in deploying the fourth. So we'll see what happens. I'm hoping to find a spot for Bob through uh, plus wanting Lily to get rid of push and thirst. So far, we have gotten rid of push. 
makes sense. Opponent hanging onto the Ether Gust makes sense too. I, I think that's probably correct from them. At the same time, it does play right into our hands, but they're not to know that. Um, maybe they have drawn Uro, and they sure have. Good God. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, now let's uh, draw Ashiok, I guess. We've drawn Unearth. Okay, picking my backup Lily at this point. Let's see what they pitch. Ether Gust. All right, we'll play Bob. We'll play. Do we shock in this Blood Crypt? Sure, why not? Give ourselves the most options here. So we need to fade a second green source. We have. All right, that's something. So no escaped Uro yet. Okay, opponent will fatal push. And they still have Blood Chief's Thirst in hand, so that's interesting to main phase that. But anyway, we'll hang on to the Unearth, see what we draw. A land, that's actually really good, because then we just plus one with a Lily relatively freely. And then we hope they have not found Cryptic Command. They have not. They hang on to Blood Chief's Thirst, so... Yeah, I'm going to unearth the Bob here, even though we know they have removal for it, because they also want to be able to destroy the Lily, right? That's why they hang on to the Thirst. So I take that back. I was like, well, maybe keeping the push is better because it's instant speed in case we do unearth or have another threat off the top. But obviously, Blood Chief's Thirst needs to answer Lily on unless they want to get ulted. They're just going to concede. Well, they had the out to the Lily, then they just only have to beat a Bob, and they have Uro in the graveyard. Maybe they're just a little upset that they didn't draw the second forest, which, again, kind of automatically beats our deck. So, uh, I'll take it. I mean, sure. So, I didn't talk about not bringing in Leyline of the Void. I think we have too much to worry about. That was my thinking anyway. And if you look at their progression, I think it's at least halfway justified because we need to be able to beat... Permission, removal, planeswalkers. Like, they are an above-ground, basically, blue-black control deck. And I don't even know if they play, like, Snapcaster Mage, right? So, Leyline is a very bad top deck and a very poor card in general. Use of a card in general when they have all that. But, but it beats Uro. But it beats Uro. So, I didn't talk as much about that. I'm kind of thinking that, like, Blood Moon beats Uro. Which is why I didn't bring in the Ley Lines. And also being on the play, we had more incentive to be more aggressive. Maybe we should consider bringing in Ley Lines on the draw. What do you guys think? If only I had a chat here or a voice call with me, I would be happy to defer or to hear arguments here. Ah. <sighs> I think I'm going to try the Ley Lines here on the draw. We came here to play the Ley Line of the Void, right? Let's do it here. This is a matchup where I would also, to be fair, not feel great about Soul Guide Lantern, but I would feel pretty great about Nile Spellbomb. Okay. On the draw. On the draw, on the draw. I'm going to cut a Lily, even though she was the game winner there. We just got to make some moves. I'm going to cut another Lightning Bolt. Play without Hazaret. And... Maybe just Lightning Skelemental a tad slow on the draw. This is probably the least confident I've been in a sideboard uh, 60 that you've seen here, so... Bear that one in mind. Um, Thought Seize into Lily with six, with five lands... Mm, man, tough call. Temptation to mulligan to Ley Line is strong. The temptation to keep Thought Season to Lily is super strong. I think I send this back, but it's close. <sighs> Punished within no land six, really. 
Got to go to five, and now we probably can't win. It's a one land five. Do we go to four? This sucks, man. I should have kept that seven. Should have kept the five land seven. I'll go to four. Still no ley line. Did I side them in? Did I did my submission work? It did. Okay, well, this is rough. Uh, we'll keep. And we have to bottom three of these amazing... This would be an incredible seven, right? So let's bottom a land because we clearly need to get lucky. Do we just go Thought Season to Blood Moon and hope that wins? I guess so. So sure. Let's bottom Seasoned Pyromancer and Lightning Skelemental <laughs> in this matchup. All right, so we'll, we're going to turn one Thought Season. We're going to see like how good our five land Thought Season Lily would have looked. I was so close to keeping that. Maybe I should have. But yo, a Bob off the top? Do we dare to hope? Nope, because they have Decay Push Monoleak, so they can beat literally everything that we are doing. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the Thought Seize into Lily would have actually been pretty okay here. I guess we'll take Monoleak, because it's the most flexible right now. If we draw more discard effects, maybe we can find a spot to stick the Bob. Draw Kroxa is pretty awesome, not going to lie. Yeah, Malta 4 against this deck is usually a death sentence, but we'll see if our, what our deck can manage to do here. So they picked a Watery Grave. We know they're full hand. It's Decay Field Push plus... Drawing for turn. Field of Ruin, that is not Field of the Dead. So they'll be able to do all kinds of basic fetching in response to Blood Moon, plus they have Decay to beat it. Nevertheless... What else are we going to do besides play it, right? Yeah, I'll play it. We just got to kind of take actions. We don't want to get time walked. We don't want to give them a chance to draw permission. And we also want to fill up the graveyard because the draw of a fourth land in the form of a red land. If we can get that to help us escape Croaks as soon as possible, that'll be a great way to win a game. Looks like they're not doing any basic fetching in response, which... I mean, they have the answer, so I get it. And if they're planning to just pass and hold up Field of Ruin, I also get it, but... Oh, they've drawn Uro. Ah! All right, but if we draw Blood Moon now... Uh, no, of course, they hit a Fetch Land off of it. I was going to say, if we draw Blood Moon now, we might still just win. We might be able to cheese the game, but drawing a second Blood Moon is a lot to ask, and... They do have Uro. They do have good old Uro. So now I would love to draw... Wow, they'd have basic forest too. Sheesh. Okay, so their hand's just Fatal Push. Love to draw discard. We draw Lightning Bolt. I guess we play Bob and it dies to push, and then we bolt and try to draw land to escape Kroxa, but I uh, guess... Can't beat Uro decks on them all to four. Sad way to lose the 5-0 chance. And I do wonder what might have happened if we just kept that seven. But it's so what we might call a disciplined mall. That's maybe a good way to put it. Obviously, we got extremely punished for it. You know, they found an Uro, though. So, like, if they're just sitting on... You know, these one-for-ones, and we get to go Thought Season to Lily and pitch some extraneous lands, then that's one thing. But if they just, like, find an Uro, we would have needed to draw well to beat it anyway. So I don't know. So I don't know. This has been a fun league, and I don't mind going 3-2 and two or 4-1 and one at all. Again, I just, like, the Uro piles make me just, like, want the game to be over. That's all.
Hmm. Okay, they do nothing here? Whatever. Volt you. I guess still no ability to push Bob and escape Uro. I'm not paying close enough attention to their colors. Okay, so no fourth land for Kroxa, but we draw another Bob. So they field. Makes our colors worse, makes their colors better. We are past the point where we want to draw another Blood Moon. It'd be pretty bad right now. Mystic Sanctuary. Okay, so they... Yeah, okay. They're going to be able to push Bob and escape the dummy. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So we're all in on drawing a fourth land for Kroxa. Even then, Uro's obviously better than Kroxa, so... So yeah, so yeah. You know, for the people who like to call me out in the comments for complaining about Uro, I think most of the people agree with me. Uh, if you look at Reddit, our modern magic, we draw a ley line of the void. That is a kick in the teeth. All right. So very unlucky with our keeps and our mulls there. Um, if we kept that seven, who knows? We at least had more of a chance than we did with a small to four. That, that much we can say beyond that. Uh, it's still a lot for our deck to beat their deck, so bad matchup. Unlucky. Um, but uh, So for the people who like to yell at me for complaining about Uro, if you look at uh, places where Magic players in general gather, this is not just a Grim Flayer MTG community thing. This is not just even a mid-range thing. All of the most upvoted posts on our Modern Magic, unless there's something unique or funny like a joke, um, they're all people saying... You know, fire design was was a mistake. Uro needs to be banned. Uro plus one needs to be banned. Things like this. So it's not just me. You got to let us vent. It's part of the character of the channel. And you can see why here, you know, we have a great league and then we run into this brick wall. And again, it's not the losing that I mind. It's the deterministic nature of draw a card money tribal uh, and what it does to traditional interactive decks. So anyway, uh, that was a feel bad one, but we're still doing great. We did show that we can beat this deck. Um, we just didn't happen to here. So uh, that is unfortunate, but we are on to round five, playing for that four and one. All right, we're back to winning the die roll, and it looks like another keep to me. Uh, we will, again, kind of follow the same principle as we did in round three, in that we're not sure if Blood Moon is what we want, therefore having two in the opener can be a little high variance, to say the least, but in blind game ones, we do love the double discard opening hand. And if Blood Moon's bad, hopefully Spyro can turn them into tokens and we can take it from there. To do either the Moon or the Spyro thing, we do need to draw a third land, of course. And the opponent, though, mulling in the face of our hand, looking pretty good. Uh, the discard spells have been huge. Huge this league. OP will stay at 6. Inquisition U. Oh, uh, we're against Yogmoth. Okay, and it's splashing white for probably... Skyclave Apparition, and Sideboard Tech. So, Young Wolf is a two-for-one. I'm probably happy to take that. Court of Calling, Strangle Root, Geist, Wall of Roots. Um, so, let's give this a, a minute's thought, I guess. Taking the Young Wolf. I mean, Young Wolf is an enabler. It's a two-for-one when we're playing the value game. I think that's fine. If we take Wolf, we're probably taking Geist next turn, and I, I think that's fine, too. So, sure, I'll take Young Wolf. We're going to time walk them this way unless they top deck a one drop, of course. And, you know, if they, like, do nothing and then go get an overgrown two on the end step, we can easily blood moon them out of the game. Um, that's definitely a real possibility. Now they'll have, uh, well, they'll actually get to resolve a wall of roots, but this, it'll still be pretty good for us to moon. Hmm, they've drawn Blooming Marsh. Okay. 
What if we instead take Wall of Roots and say we can beat a Strangle Root Geist if they're Blood Mooned out of the game? So it's a little strange in terms of our sequencing, but we're just hoping they don't draw basic land for ever, and we get to, as we say, moon them out of the game. Now, if the opponent just grabs a basic here and next levels us, maybe we should have uh, maybe we should have played a Blood Crypt tapped, but okay, they don't. Good. <laughs> It probably would have been better sequencing to play a Blood Crypt tapped. I kind of forgot about that because I was focused on the discard decision, of course. But... We're going to see how this plays out for us. We're definitely playing with fire with our life total a little bit, but again, we're hoping for the... Basically free win off of Blood Moon, and with Spyro backing it up, it seems, again, like we can beat a Strangle Root Geist, right? Alright, pretty easy pitch of land, fetch land and Blood Moon to the Spyro here. Hang on to the Lightning Bolt. And we've drawn another Spyro and a land that casts the Bolt, which is a beautiful thing. OP getting mooned out here. All right, I think we're incentivized to dump out our hand in the face of a Spyro, so we'll bolt the front half of Geist. Then we will untap. Draw Magmatic Channeler, which is pretty intriguing. But are we supposed to just keep digging with Pyromancer? I'm not certain. I'm going to play the Channeler here. I think, I think we have reason to believe the OP is locked out for the foreseeable future. And therefore, we don't, like, need... Ooh, Phyrexian Revoker and Dryad Arbor. So they dump out a couple playables, and Arbor could do some work. And they'll name Channeler. Interesting, interesting, okay. Ooh, now I really wish we'd play Spyro last turn. We get punished in a couple different ways. I think we're supposed to leave Red open, but that is unclear. Hmm. Now, let's leave black open, because we can draw push or thirst, or a red land plus a dread boar. But yeah, we're punished for playing out the channeler here in a pretty big way. Because it's now revoked, and now we draw the third Spyro, which we have to loot away. I would much rather have looted and just keep chaining Spyros, and they just probably can't beat that when they're getting blood mooned. Oh, we do draw the Dread Boar, but we also draw our second basic swamp. Okay. Should still be fine. You know, these are still some pretty okay finds. Um, but we're letting them untap with green. It's not necessarily clear that we are supposed to hit the Dryad Arbor anyway. With Dread Boar, but... Okay, Black Cleave Cliffs. So now I think we're supposed to hit the Revoker so we can turn the Cliffs into gas off of Channeler. Also grow the Channeler, but I think this turn we're supposed to keep digging. OP cannot quite cord. All right, let's dig through the deck. Inquisition. Sure. They'll scoop to that. All right, so Blood Moon. Our line to go in on the Blood Moon and to take the Wall of Roots, 100% rewarded. Um, there is a little awkwardness from there. The opponent gave us a little scare with a, you know, slow rolling one or the other of Arbor and Revoker, then playing them both out at the same time. But still, their style was cramped so much by the Moon that we do 
uh, flood the board with Spiros and have so much card selection and advantage that we do have a very small fail rate from there. So, I think Leyline is good here. There's a lot to consider. We're probably not playing Ashiok on the draw. Let's, so let's say not. I want Kalidus for sure. I want Rampage. Hazarat seems good. Plague Engineer seems good. Brutalities seem good. We obviously cannot overboard. Um, you know what I think I might do is consider cutting most or all Blood Moons on the draw. So they know about it. They're going to play around it. It's still really good against them. And it still might be correct to leave them in. But as you can see, we have so much to bring in. I think I'm cutting Liliana's on the draw here. Probably cut a Bob. Maybe trim a little bit on discard, splitting the difference between Thoughtseize being able to tag Yogmoth and Inquisition being more generous with our life total. Maybe trim and unearth too. Again, most of the cards we're cutting are fine. I'm going to cut a couple Skelementals. I want a sideboard heavily for this final matchup, don't you? Isn't that just cool? Isn't it just fun? Um, yeah, let's do it. Look at all these cards to bring in. We still have to make two cuts. Are we really going to side in 12 in, 12 out? Should, maybe we should do that just to say we did one time. All right, I'm going to do it. We're, we're just having fun here. Blood Moon out. Skelemental out. You know what? No, I'm going to leave a miserly one of moon and we'll cut all Skelementals. Sure. I think this is pretty good, actually, despite our 12 and 12 out and the freewheeling nature of it. We'll see how this all feels, of course, if there is a game three we can revisit. Um, Lightning Bolt Unearth Spyro. You know, it's not the most impressive hand of all time. I think I am going to keep it, though. Opponent with a Leyline of Sanctity. Well, I'm glad I didn't mull aggressively toward Disruption. Leyline of Sanctity, really. All right, a Leyline 7 on the play is pretty scary. Into Young Wolf is also quite scary. We've drawn Angrath's Rampage, huh? The Unearth in the Spyro is pretty cool because we can trade resources a bit, we can fix our hand with Spyro, we can trade Spyro off, then Unearth him. That's kind of the idea behind the keep. Oof, so many young wolves. I think I'm bolting one of them just for something to do, and we have to chew through this board, but this is definitely a little rough. Obviously, this is an example of where Leyline would have been great to open on. Inquisition, pretty bad. So, I'm just going to take actions here. I'm just going to, like, cast a Rampage and try to set up for the Spyro game. It's very poor value-wise. Oh, no, Rampage is shut off, too, by Leyline. Hold up. Hold up. Um, I forgot all about that. Well, then. We are getting wrecked by Leyline of Sanctity into Young Wolves. We'll see if Spyro can bail us out, but you know. You know, that's pretty rough. So this is one way in which we could say, okay, if we want to wind back the sideboarding a little bit, maybe we err on the side of shaving things that get hosed by Leyline of Sanctity. I'll kind of pretend that I'm considering instant speed removal here, but, but we're not. But we're not. Okay, Evo. The unhurt young, the un undying, the un undying young wolf into. Not Yogmoth, oh, Scavenging Ooze. Big yikes. All right. With that, I'm going to cycle Unearth because we're not getting to Unearth Spyro in the face of Scooze. And we draw Swamp and Leyline of the Void, bruh. Well, we're getting beat pretty soundly, you have to assume. 
But right now, at least, there's nothing for Scoos to eat. And I think we're supposed to just ditch our dead cards in the face of Leyline. So as much as we're flooded and we could do that, let's make tokens instead. We draw a second Ley Line of the Void and a Lightning Bolt. Okay. Well, so far the Ley Line inclusions have not paid off. We're ripping them off the top. We're not seeing them in the openers. Not seeing them in the opener despite a multi four for them. Not for them, but you get it. So, we now need the opponent to be at a bit of a bottleneck, and they are. Lovely. Lovely. All right, let's draw another low curve spell. Oh my god, we draw the third ley line. That sucks. Are we. I think we're supposed to cast a ley line here. I think we're behind enough that we're taking the high upside line of hope they continue to stay bottlenecked, cast a ley line of the void. Obviously, the chance to bolt Scoos is right there for us, but we'll do that next turn. It'll be fine. Trust me. <laughs> Maybe they're just not bottlenecked at all, and they're holding up Court of Calling, and this is all going to be a disaster. But again, I think we're having so many things go wrong that we're going to take the high upside lines. Well, that's not a Court of Calling. They're just going to kind of, like eat our graveyard so Kroxa doesn't and Channeler don't thrive off of it, which makes total sense, but and they pass again. Well, well. All right, I mean, I guess we cast another Ley Line and then wait for them to tap out just in case it matters. And we go for the Bolt. We do have another Mountain to fetch, sure. I'll hang on, hang on to the third Ley Line in case of another Spyro draw off the top or something similar. Now's a fine time to Lightning Bolt. So this is some pretty weak stuff from our deck. But, again, the opponent had a bit of a bottleneck, it seems, with mana, but then they draw the fourth land. I assume that's kind of what they were waiting for. Maybe this is Yawgmoth. At least we have Leyline, and at least their wolves are already undying, but we need a kill spell for Yogg still. As soon as we can. Black Cleave Cliffs. You hate to see it. All right, well. Opponent had a really nice opening progression. We didn't. We've had some of the worst top decks imaginable. So even though opponent's having a fail rate again, we've just been pretty far behind for a pretty long time at this stage. There's the Geist. Yogmoth is pro-human, so we don't have the ability to mob block him. Will opponents start trying to force some damage over the line here? All right. <clears throat> Take that block. I'm going to take this block and then flash back the tokens. Okay. Proliferate. 
pretty strong right now. It's not an ability that comes up often, but definitely a good one. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe I should have blocked with the elemental I left back too. That was probably a mistake. Well played to the opponent. We just draw another cliffs anyway. All right. Can't win when this happens, so opponent got us. Um, Leyline of Sanctity. Interesting. We have to assume they're not going to just keep really strong Leyline 7s, uh, both post-side games. Though that'd be pretty bad if they did. <laughs> Am I right? So... I want to go even further away from discard in face of that. I think we leave removal shy away from discard if we're playing around Leyline at all. I also want to bring back Blood Moon in a bigger way. Like, it does just kind of beat their deck pretty badly. They're very vulnerable to it, right? Okay, I think playing the Blood Moon game makes a lot of sense here. I'm going to cut Hazaret just to reduce Clunk, although the card's good here. Hasn't been the league for Hazaret to shine. Do we go down to three discard spells? I think that's honestly okay. Sure. This is definitely real tough uh, to optimize, but I think something like this is pretty reasonable given what we've seen. Maybe we don't need all three Kroxa, but... Alright, show us the nutty Ley Line 7. There's no Ley Line. We have two removal spells and a Spyro. I'm probably supposed to keep this. I'm going to keep. I think it's a very reasonable keep. OP will mull. We love to see that. Okay, they keep six and no ley line on their side either. I accept. Ether Vial. Whoa, we didn't see those in the first couple games. Fair enough. They're definitely not always in the deck, and I didn't know if they would still be in against us post-side, but they seem to be. We have drawn another Spyro. Okay, well, the, the plan with this hand was always to just kind of jam Spyros and go wide. All right, they've got a couple basics, too. And Wall of Roots, man, they're playing around our stuff pretty well here. Really wish we had Fatal Push instead of Thirst or Bolt. Push has been sided out the whole league, and just when we need it, we don't have it. Anyway, that's okay. Um, I hope. <laughs> All right, we're certainly going to jam a Spyro here. I guess it is incumbent upon us to... Pitch Unearth and Land. Obviously, we love the Unearth synergy, but let's not depend on them killing our thing for it to be good, I guess. We've drawn Brutality and Cliffs. This is actually pretty scary. Like, we're getting an unusual, weird half of the deck problem. Like, we're drawing nominally a bunch of fine stuff. They vial in another Wall of Roots. Got it. So no Yawgmoth, because no double black, but they have Geist, sure. I think at this point we just straight up ignore the walls. I'm just going to play another Spyro. 
hang on to all of our good stuff, keep going wide. I'm going to ditch cliffs in one of these two brutalities that we've drawn. Mountain Plague Engineer. Yeah, seems fine. Alright, so this is a big mess of a value game on both sides here. Our value game definitely looking a little better, though, you have to say. But anything can happen. This looks like a Court of Calling, which is really scary. They're courting for four. It can only be for Yawgmoth. So let's bolt here in response, I guess. We can kill Yawgmoth with Blood Chief's Thirst. See if they have any other payoffs. Not really. Birds of Paradise, it's not really what they want to see, but Eldritch Evolution for birds it is, and maybe they can get, yep, Garolf's Messenger. Uh-huh. Yeah. Dang. Okay. Are we just dead? Yep. I think so. Yeah, because they have more life than us, and it's the same. All right. That's unreal. Uh, and you know what? We we lost because we drew um, cards that weren't Fatal Push. You know, if we had been able to, like, push a wall or push the Yawgmoth better off, we would be in business there. But... Blood Chief's Thirst really, really letting us down by being sorcery speed there and clunky. Um, Lightning Bolt, obviously not lining up against those big toughness things there, too. I think bolting in response to the uh, Strangle Root Geist was fine there, but, you know, maybe we can't beat what they had regardless. Our problem was just clunk. It was just clunk. I think that's a cool matchup. It's a winnable matchup. Um, their progression was pretty good, and they had a lot of resiliency for the combo. But, again, if our... Like, you have to keep the... Um, like, you have to say that Bolts and Thirst are good early turn plays if you're evaluating an opening hand, but it, it turns out they weren't. Um, and it's just one of those weird things where the opponent drew the right half of the deck against our half of our removal half of the deck, and that's what enabled them to sneak in that win before we got to untap and kill the Yawgmoth. So definitely really unlucky there, but I don't even feel bad. That was just cool. That was just cool, good magic, and that could have gone either way. The Uro pile is another matter, right? So uh, the, the deck felt amazingly strong, but we do finish 3-2. and two. Um, yeah, so let's talk about it. The Eternal Midrange Conundrum actually came up in a pretty big way here, because Fatal Push was our first cut in a majority of these matchups, but Fatal Push was also the card we missed the most in the final crucial game of this league that denied us the 4-1. So, on the one hand, you can say we need more pushes, because it is the best spot removal, especially right now in the format at, at 1 mana. Or you could say, you know, the fact that they are dead cards in a lot of matches and the fact that we side them out a lot means that it is correct to lean more into Bolt and Thirst. This is something that there is no one answer to, guys. We just got to keep tweaking as the meta changes, and every now and then you'll just get unlucky like we did here in the, in the decisive match. But don't get it wrong. We definitely had our fair share of great variants through the first half of this league. It was awesome. Literally, as soon as Uro reared his ugly head, everything fell apart. But losing to Yawgmoth is cool. You know, that was a fun match. I like the value game that plays a... Uh, the value deck that plays a combo game. It's it's pretty cool. Um, I do think, again, we got a bit unlucky. But in Game 1, we saw the power of Blood Moon. So we do play a pile of removal. We do play Ley Lines. All of this stuff is pretty good against them. I think we got a little unfortunate post-side to get caught 
like that um, with a hand that did not hate them out with Leyline or Moon, but otherwise showed every sign of being able to beat them a, in a traditional way. Didn't quite happen for us, but I would be fine with this matchup against Yawgmoth. Against the Uro Pile, yeah, we can cheese him with Blood Moon, we can have our depletion line up, but as we all know, Uro should just be banned. Uro plus one, whatever it's going to be. Um, this is a very much a consensus opinion. We're seeing a lot of pros speak up about this now, too. We saw um, somebody on my Discord, forgive me, I forget who, posted that LSV was, I believe, playing Vintage. Correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. LSV was on stream playing a lot of Vintage, having a ton of fun, and then he's like, I'm loving Magic so much right now, let's play Modern. And I think he was having fun with Modern until he ran into Uro, and it's the exact same reaction I have. It's like, I just don't want to play. I just don't want to play this. Um, Modern is actually really cool in a lot of ways right now. The piles are egregious. We hate them. And uh, Aspiring Spike, I believe, has now changed his opinion as well, said that Uro should be banned, and the LSV commentary, I believe, influenced that. And again, whenever it's put to popular opinion, like, on the same places, like, in our modern magic where people complain about people calling for bans all the time, at the same time, everybody's upvoting the idea that fire design with all the draw card uh, value bombs is a problem, and that Uro and associated things are a problem, too. So there you go. There's my case about it. What did we learn? Uh, bringing it back home, bringing it back to Benny's list, what did we learn here? Well, I don't know. Um, the deck felt incredible. I think in many ways this was representative, because, you know, 3-2 is, is often in general representative of most decks, showing you how it can win and how it can lose. And we saw Blood Moon was the path to victory in a lot of matchups. We saw some nutty, nutty ways to close out and deplete with Skelemental against Tron specifically. We saw Spyro, the glue of the deck, when things needed to progress into the mid-game. We saw Lily look really good. We saw Kroxa look really good. And we saw spots where Dark Confidant would have been very much better than Channeler and vice versa. Um, I believe that Willy Adel has said that Channeler is the new Bob or something to that effect. I really like the split. I really like Bob in this list. I think Bob was great, basically, whenever we saw him. And obviously, that's only one sample size. But I think structurally, Bob is a good fit, too. And, you know, Prowess is not as dominant as it was a while ago. That's for sure. A lot of the decks that do play Swifty um, are now Shadow decks, where Bob is actually a lot better than against a more traditional Prowess deck with lots of Lava Darts and all the rest, and more of a straight-out aggressive plan. In any case, um, so I think all of our main deck threats looked awesome. I was very, very pleased with Unearth here. You know, I was pleased with the land base, too. We flooded a bit, but it was really important to get our colors correct, to get our graveyard fueled, and to have everything enter untapped. And we did achieve that here with a very streamlined 22 land base. Um, maybe you could argue for a 23rd land just to ensure we're curving out and to ensure that we don't take as many mulligans. That did hurt us this league. And the 23rd land could be a utility land. That's where it would come in. But if you're keeping the land count low, keeping the gas count high, I do like this very clean, very productive in its main role of simply casting spells on curve, mana base. Uh, the discard was good. The interaction for the board was, I think, unusually off base here. Just like kind of drawing the wrong stuff when we needed it as far as the one drops go. We ripped Dreadbore at like <laughs> the exact right time every time we saw it. I'm tempted to say on the basis of this league we could use a second one, but obviously that's already kind of a high curve deck and we don't want to get too greedy in that regard either. Sideboard, I don't know. I don't know what to make about the sideboard. Uh, Hazaret seemed like a card I was struggling to justify making room for, and we obviously never got to cast her. The Rampages were pretty good, but we ran into a nasty surprise of it getting shut off by a Leyline of Sanctity, something to keep in mind. Didn't need Reign of Gore. Maybe could have been cute, brought it in against Uro, but I felt we had too much else to do. Ashiok was great. Uh, you can always have a second Ashiok in a black-based mid-range deck. I would think this is no exception. Ley lines, I know they looked horrible here. 
Uh, maybe some of you will say that this is a reason why we shouldn't play Leyline. Maybe that's correct. Nevertheless, my my stance was never Leyline is the best graveyard hate to play. My stance was that I don't really love Soul Guide Lantern, although I understand why people play it. So if we are going to explore Leyline in general, or if we are going to explore an alternative to Spellbomb that does similar things to what Soul Guide does, this is a great shell to try Leyline in. And we only had it in for three games, so a very small sample size. Nevertheless, it, it did look bad, we have to admit that. Uh, Kalidas, I think, is a good fit in the deck. Whether Modern has passed him by is another question, but if he can see play, it's probably in a shell just like this one. Plague Man, great as always, but maybe not very strictly necessary if you need to move things around. And I think two Brutality is the right number if you want to play the card. As you saw here, I was bringing in two more often than all three even when it was good. So those are my thoughts on the list. If you would like to tweak it, maybe they help you tweak it. I think this was a really fun league. Um, I regret queuing into Uro. Other than that, it was just super fun. Good, clean, modern. And we are doing some enormously powerful things. Rakdos does feel higher variance than Rock. The highs are higher, the lows are lower. I think we encounter that here. Benny Jackson, my friend, thank you so much for the support. Thank you for giving me a really cool and fun list to play. I hope this was enlightening and entertaining for you, and maybe it helps us make some tweaks going forward. Uh, definitely a big fan of this archetype. I love to see it doing well. I love to see people playing it. And I hope you guys out there had fun watching. Thank you very much once again to Benny and also to our newest Patreon supporters. We have Stephanie Pace, the Inquisitor, and Elusive Fate, the Unearthed. A big shout out to the new and old Patreons alike. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned to the channel. We are doing more gameplay like this. I will cover Kaldheim spoilers when they are being released and we have another tournament from the discord just like battle for the veil battle for the bob we're keeping the theme of this one under wraps but it is something again not a normal modern tournament so we'll see you hopefully for all of those things give this a like give this a thumbs up subscribe to the channel leave a comment you guys know what to do to make the content grow and i thank you for doing so Talk to you soon. Hope everybody out there has a wonderful day.